Hey, no more horsepower guessing games for us. Yeah, wait till you see the latest addition to our shop in action. Today on Horsepower TV, take cover for a small block shootout. We'll explore the new Chevy and Ford crate engines before we welcome to our new engine dyno to see who's got the top horsepower numbers. And a shoebox bonanza as we go back to the days of the 49 through 51 Fords and Mercury's. And a tip on how to use spacers to get more power out of your car. So hang on for Horsepower TV. Hey, welcome again to Horsepower TV. There's an ongoing argument between Ford fans and Chevy stalwarts over who's got the stoutest small block. A battle that's been waged on and off the track for years, and today we're going to duke it out right here in the shop. Yeah, now both manufacturers offer stout-hearted small blocks right out of the crate, and they both benefit from proven parts, ample output, and affordable price tags. So we ordered the latest and greatest small blocks from both Ford and Chevy to give you a close-up look at the hardware it takes and the horsepower they make. What's more, we're going to stage a small block slugfest using the newest addition to the horsepower shop, our portable engine dyno we got from Land and Sea that measures up to 800 horsepower. Now this is the control console where we can measure things like horsepower, torque, and all the engine's vital signs. Plus, the computer makes all the calculations and stores them in memory, which comes in pretty handy when you're doing things like component-to-component -component testing. Now, this is the actual dyno test stand that mounts the engine and provides the connections for sensors and other hookups. Back here, we have the absorption unit, which is essentially a large water break that's connected to the engine with this special dyno drive coupler that we got from McLeod Industries. Now, this thing will bolt up to either flywheels or flex plates and accepts this special 10-spline shaft from the absorption unit. Now, what that absorption unit does, actually, is measure engine torque and, well, of course, horsepower is a mathematical calculation of torque and RPM. Well, now that we know how it works, what do you say we meet the challengers? First, the Ford. It's a 351 Windsor rated at 385 horsepower. And since it's a Windsor, it's a perfect replacement for earlier Mustangs, like this K-Code convertible here, or even later model 5-liter ponies. Well, over here we've got GM Performance Parts ZZ5 350, also rated at 385 horse. Now, since it's based on the same small block that's been around since 1955, well, this thing will bolt between the frame rails of everything from a full-size Chevy to a Chevelle or even a Camaro. Well, the small block Ford's no newcomer either. It's been waving the blue oval banner since 1963. But the parts that make up this wild Windsor are all new, starting with the Sportsman block. Now, it's 15 pounds heavier than the older production block, with most of the weight here in the main bulkheads and pan rails. Of course, these ribs here are new for increased stability, and both the cylinders and decks are thicker to minimize distortion. Hey, don't think I didn't notice those two-bolt mains. Now, the GM block is a cast-iron four-bolt main unit that's been around since about 1969. Now, it's nothing special, but it's plenty stout enough. And besides, why mess with something that works? Now, the crankshaft is forged from premium steel, and it features polished journals, radiused oil holes, and rolled fillets to help minimize stress risers and eliminate crank failure. Well, steel is no big deal. The Ford's crank is a nodular casting with the same features of the GM for the same reasons. But the balancer, well, it's an SFI-approved unit with dual timing marks and pulley boat patterns to accommodate both early and late model applications. See, the Ford guys were looking out for you and your engine swap ideas. The piston is a high silicone hyperutectic piece with a reverse dome to yield a pump gas friendly 9 to 1 compression ratio. Now it's hung on a beefy Windsor truck rod with more meat around the big end and a set of high tensile strength bolts. The ZZ motor uses hyperutectic pistons too, but these are a flat top design to promote good flame travel across the piston face and they'll yield about a 9.6 compression ratio so they'll be compatible with pump gas too. Now, the connecting rods are high-tech all the way. They're powdered metal forgings that use crack cap technology and a set of high tensile strength bolts for improved clamping. 
Very impressive there, Bowtie Bubba. But so much for the bottom end of our screaming small blocks. Right now, we got to get to the bottom line and take a commercial break. Hey, but don't go away. The big duel on the dyno is coming right up. Stay tuned as we mash the gas to see if it's the Chevy or the Ford making the most power on our new engine dyno. For the latest news on Horsepower TV, check us out online at horsepowertv.com. All right, welcome back to our small block shootout. We showed you the bottom end of our crate motors. Now let's see how they're finished up before we put them on the dyno. Ford Racing Performance Parts shows their aluminum GT40 heads to contain the combustion in that 351. The chambers are a high swirl designed to promote combustion efficiency, and they spec out at 64 cc's. Now, the stainless valves are swirl polished and undercut to promote flow. They measure 194 on the intake, 154 on the exhaust. But GM Performance Parts fast burn heads are practically race ready right out of the box. Now, check this out. They've got a heart shaped combustion chamber to promote that fast burn, and well, I guess that's how they got their name. And they're fitted with a two inch hollow stemmed intake valve that's made out of stainless steel. The exhaust valve is a 1560 that's sodium filled and it comes with a three angle valve job right from the factory and also their back cut to help promote that low lift flow. The intake ports have been redesigned with a raised roof to give you a straighter shot at the combustion chamber and over here on the exhaust side, well a little redesign has gone on there too, again with a raised roof and a D-shaped port to improve scavenging. The ZZ5 uses the same roller tappet camshaft as the ZZ4, but those heads just beg for more valve timing, so we're going to install GM's hot cam upgrade. Now, you can use your same old hydraulic roller lifters, but the kit comes with a set of these 1.6 roller rockers that are going to help increase your net lift. Now, chances are those rollers aren't going to fit under those stamped steel valve covers that come on the crate engine, so you're going to need a set of tall valve covers like these polished aluminum pieces from GM Performance. Yeah, well, the Windsor's camshaft is largely responsible for its 385 hard-hitting horses. It's a fairly aggressive flat tappet hydraulic cam that specs out at 50 thousandths at 236 degrees intake, 246 degrees exhaust. Now, the lifters and push rods are straight production pieces, but proven performers, as is the timing set. Now, it's a double roller with multiple keyways at the crank sprocket so you can advance or retard your timing. Like the Chevy, the rocker arms are fully rollerized to reduce friction, but these are pedestal mounted for simplicity and reliability. Fuel distribution duties are up to this Victor Junior style single plane intake. Now the open plenum and individual runners here allow this engine to breathe easy on up to the 6,000 red line. Well, you better catch your breath before we bolt these things to the dyno, because I'm telling you, this Chevy is one heavy breather. Now it uses a dual plane intake with raised runners to match the ones on the heads and a divided plenum here to pump up that bottom end torque. Now the incoming fuel charge is lit off with this GM HEI ignition and this induction ignition combination ought to be good for six grand easy. Well it should come as no shock to you that our ignition's up to the task too. Ford falls back on its reliable DuraSpark distributor with high performance cap and rotor that have brass terminals and contacts. Now the final touch on this wild Windsor is a pair of polished aluminum valve covers to make sure it's all dressed up when it's time to go. Speaking of which, enough show and tell, it's time for the showdown. You got that right. Now I've already bolted up the small block Chevy to the dyno stand here and just to make sure that we're on a level playing ground, we're going to replace both OE ignitions in the engines with this Holly Annihilator setup. Now it includes the controller box, coil, distributor and wires, plus we're going to use their 800 CFM double pumper carb and a set of hooker street style headers with one and three quarter inch primaries. Now, hey, I don't know about you, but man, I'm ready to make some noise. Hey, 
man, 448 horsepower. You know, the stock ZZ4 is only rated at 355 horse, so I guess that hot cam and fast burn heads are really doing the job. Yeah, I guess so. Well, I bet that Windsor's just as strong. Come on, let's get that mouse off the stand and get the rat killer run. I'm with you. <laughs> well, now we're ready to see if this bad blue oval can exterminate the mouse's numbers. Okay, Windsor's rated at 385 and we made uh, 412 there. That's better than I expected. It really is. That was a great run. <laughs> now, you did come up a little bit short compared to that small block Chevy, but hey, both of these crate engines are winners in our book. Now, stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. Hey, like our new toy. Oh, man, this is great. Check this out. I can't believe all Torn. the information we get off of this thing. Next, it's a shoebox bonanza you don't want to miss as we go back to the days of the 49 through 51 Fords and Mercury's up in Motor City. Their passion is Ford shoeboxes and Mercury bathtubs made from 1949 to 51. And most drove their revered rides to this annual meet just outside of Motor City. It's an event that evolved from a growing Ford and Merc fanaticism among Jim Genty's generation. We were probably driving 30s and 40s cars, and when the shoebox Fords came out in 49, the 49 Mercury's came out, they were just instant hits with everybody. And almost everybody found out a way to get one. From taillights to tailpipe, some are just as bone stock as when they got them. Others represent a half century of hot riding and customizing on an ever popular platform. It's what you would call highly modified. Uh, it's been bored out, it's stroked, ported, it's relieved, it's got a four barrel carburetor in it and a three-quarter race cam, which makes it uh, quite swift. Everybody responds to the car, either with a look, a smile, a high five, a thumbs up. Well, it's a smooth, strong, reliable vehicle, and it makes a trip for a mile for a loaf of bread or 1,300 miles from Florida a pure joy. Eugene Blackwell's pride and joy is the 51 Mercury he found after a six-year search. It's got 24 coats of paint and some unique touches from the Continental kit to the outside sun visors. It's all molded into the car. There's no seams. They usually have uh, like bolts in the, this, the roof, you know, and that didn't look cool. So I had them mold it right into the roof. The Continental kit is molded into the body. There's no seams, uh, no place. It was four years in the making, but the result is an old Merc masterpiece. The only bad part is we have that 4x60 air conditioning. Do you know what that is? Uh, no. 60 mile an hour and four windows open. Well, speaking of cool customs, a California Ford freak drove this beauty to Plymouth, a guy who couldn't decide if he wanted a 1950 or a 51. Ford started making Victoria's hardtops in 1951. Uh, I always preferred the simpler grill and trim from the 1950 models, so I started with a 51 Victoria and fitted all the pieces from a 50 front end, rear end, dash, uh, and so it gives the illusion of being a 50 Victoria even though they don't exist. My wife was sitting in the car yesterday and two women walked by and one of the women looked at it and said, well, that must be some prototype of something they're going to make. And the other woman said, you boob, that's a 50 Ford. <laughs> <laughs> and they were both wrong in a way. Right. <laughs> right. Okay, while customizing choices run the gamut, most of these Ford and Mercury guys have one thing in common. 
And that's a monumental motor, the fabulous Flathead V8 that was planted in these cars until the early 50s. The old timers will tell you that nothing sounds like a Flathead. And, and, and that's really true. Uh, you'll hear these cars throughout the day start up, you'll know a Flathead right away. Well, here's where you can hear dozens of Flatheads humming in units. And a story cruise around the Ford Dearborn testing grounds. Maybe for the first time since they were test driven here five decades ago. You get behind the wheel of this and you're 16 all over again. And I guess that's what us old goats are doing. We're buying our youth back, you know, but costs a lot of money, but it's worth every penny of it, yeah. Hopefully, newer generations will someday carry the torch of enthusiasm for classic mid-century shoeboxes, pounding the pavement and turning heads on into the next century and beyond. You've got grandfathers encouraging grandkids, and you got some young guys that are real excited about building a car just like Grandpa had. For more horsepower, join us online at horsepowertv.com. Welcome back. Now, here's a quick tip that'll help you lower your ETs on the track and pump up your performance on the street. Carb spacers are an inexpensive way to get a few extra horses out of just about any engine. Now, basically, they fall into two styles, open and four-hole plenum. Now, the open style well, that's going to increase your plenum volume to enhance upper RPM horsepower, while the four holers increase mixture velocity to pump up that bottom end torque and mid-range power. Spacers come in varying thicknesses, and to use them as a tuning aid, well, you need to know your engine's needs. For instance, if your engine lays down on the top end, you can compensate for it by adding this open style spacer, starting with a half incher, then work your way up till you find your engine's sweet spot. But if your engine lays down right off the line, this four holer can help move your power band further down the RPM scale. And of course, the thicker the spacer, the greater the mixture velocity. Now that's going to mean you're going to get off the line just a little bit better. The type of material that a spacer is made from can also affect its efficiency. For instance, wood is the absolute best at insulating your carb from heat, and it's real easy to reshape to match your intake manifold. Now, unfortunately, gas breaks it down, so you're going to have to inspect and replace these fairly often. Phenolic resin is a durable material that's also a good insulator and pretty easy to reshape, but from a cost standpoint, well, it's a little more expensive than either wood or plastic. Of course, plastic spacers are the least expensive, but they conduct more heat and they can't be modified as easily as the wood or phenolic resin. Finally, we have the aluminum spacers, which are extremely durable, but they're the poorest insulators out of the whole bunch. Now, they're available in the widest variety of thicknesses and can even be stacked to give you a real tower of power. Of course, they say that knowledge is also power, and well, now you know how spacers, like these that we got from Moroso, can help you get the most out of your motor. Well, it's time to give our sponsors a little space, too, and we'll be back with hot parts right after this. And now, hot parts, brought to you by carparts.com. Everything for your car, truck, van, or SUV. When this 67 was new, an open element air cleaner like this one was considered state of the art. But if you've got a 96 to 98 Mustang with a modular V8, well, K&N's got a more high-tech way to give it more giddy-up. It's a new cold air kit with an injection-molded inlet that bolts right up your throttle body. That cool, dense air is filtered through K&N's million-mile element for more horsepower and efficiency. It's an efficient use of your bolt-on budget, too, at under $300. If you put more air in your motor, well, it's going to want more fuel, too. And Edelbrock has stepped up with their line of high-performance mechanical fuel pumps. Now, they're available for most popular applications, and the racing version cranks out an amazing 130 gallons per hour, while the street version tops out at about 110. They're fully rebuildable and compatible with both gasoline and alcohol fuels, and, hey, they're also compatible with your budget. Prices start at about 65 bucks. After you put all that air and fuel in your motor, it's got to get out. They make headers now for just about every application, but when you can't find a set to fit, well, Headman's Weld Your Own Kit might be the answer. 
Now it comes with an assortment of mandrel bit pipe, header flanges, and even a pair of pre-welded collectors. Now this is a good way to take the pain out of your next engine swap or race car project, and it won't put a lot of pain on your pocketbook at $335. Well, we're just aching to tell you about next week's show. Take a peek. We'll pump up the power in a late model Mustang with a cold air kit, power pulleys, oversized throttle body, and high performance exhaust. In another new race of the week, it's a fast festival of speed for Fords only. And how lead still leads the way when it comes to street rod resto projects. And remember, high performance fun is what this show is all about. Well, I had fun today, but we ought to give that Ford one more pull. What I'm with you, man. I'm way ahead of you. You know, there's nothing better than the sound of a small box screaming on the dyno. Woo -hoo. For information about the products used in today's show and more, check us out online at horsepowertv.com. Horsepower TV is an RTM production.